afternoon, sorry, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, those who are joining us online. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the RSIS World Humanitarian Day 2021. And today's um, webinar will look at the theme, responses to crisis during pandemic, challenges and new modalities. We would like to thank you first for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to participate in this event. As you may all know, the World Humanitarian Day marks the anniversary of the 2003 bombing of the UN headquarters in Baghdad, Iraq, when 22 humanitarian workers were killed. Ever since, the date is an opportunity to pay respect to all humanitarian workers around the world as well as to strengthen the understanding of and respect for international humanitarian law. Every day, humanitarian aid workers help millions of people around the world, regardless of who they are and where they are. Such efforts, therefore, cannot go unrecognized by the rest of the international community. This annual event to commemorate the World Humanitarian Day brings together local players in the humanitarian sphere to celebrate the dedication of humanitarian workers around the world and to remember those in most need of assistance. It aims to raise public awareness on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in the region by providing a venue for exchange of ideas, insights, and experiences from the speakers. We are commemorating World Humanitarian Day at a time when the international community continues to grapple with the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. What started out as an emergency response to curb the deadly disease has evolved into a protracted crisis management exercise, straddling the boundaries of humanitarian and developmental actors with significant implications for governments and for non-state actors. We therefore convene today's webinar with the aim of reflecting on a number of issues we face in the midst of this crisis. Specifically, we will examine one, the challenges faced by the humanitarian sector during COVID-19, two, look at potential solutions and initiatives to help elevate these challenges, and three, look at the risk perception and its effects on crisis management. We are very lucky and we are very delighted also to have with us three distinguished speakers, Ms. our old friend, Ms. Carolyn Rasad, um, Anne Moy, and Amy George. They will be, of course, introduced later on by the moderator all of whom have ex significant experiences in humanitarianism and who will share their reflections on dealing with the new normal that we live in. I look forward to the sharing of personal experiences from the field as we continue in this effort to acknowledge and embrace the complex challenges faced by humanitarian workers and salute the excellent work that they do to provide assistance to those who need it most. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Melly. Um, I'm Al Cook and the moderator for today's webinar, which is our seventh uh, annual RSIS World Humanitarian Day event, uh, the second that we're hosting online due to the uh, current pandemic. Uh, as mentioned, we have three speakers, but before I introduce them, I would like to alert you to the Chatham House rule, which we abide by in our events, uh, which means that participants are free to use the information shared, um, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speaker, nor that of any participant may be revealed. So please do keep that in mind to ensure the free flow of ideas and discussion. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Caroline Brassard, uh, who's an adjunct assistant professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, who will share with us her uh, recent risk perception survey in Singapore, particularly around issues of access to resources and support 
and the social and economic impacts of COVID-19. Our second speaker is Miss Anne Moy, who's the Private Sector Partnerships Manager for UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, uh, Private Sector Partnership Service here in Singapore. Our third speaker is Aimee George, who is the Regional Humanitarian Operations Assistant Manager at Save the Children Asia, also uh, Regional HQ here in Singapore, who will share with us uh, the role of INGOs adapting to the pandemic and some of the innovations that have um, been utilized during um, the recent challenges around child-focused interventions. So with that, and um, without uh, further ado, may I invite uh, Dr. Brassard? Uh, so today I would like to uh, present uh, the results of an online survey that was conducted uh, within an international partnership. And I wish to thank also RSIS for helping us to, to uh, publish these results. It is the first time that the results are being uh, shared uh, in the public. So this is uh, uh, the team was uh, comprised the members of uh, NTU, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, where I'm based, uh, the Weather and Climate Risk Group in Zurich, and the financing came from the Earth Observatory of Singapore. My colleagues who are co-authors to this uh, research are Patrick Daly, who is the lead faculty, uh, Jamie McCaughey, Ruben Eng, Lavanya Kativa Ravalu, and Benjamin Horton. So what we did is conducting an online survey every two weeks during the lockdown. So that was taking place last year from May to July. So we had six rounds of online survey. It was a representative survey of 1,000 respondents. And I have to insist that the respondents were only Singaporeans and PRs. No other group were included in our research. So if we recall that the cases of COVID-19 were very pronounced, leading, so in April, leading to the lockdown that started in early May. So the government uh, imposed strict border restrictions, closure of non-essential businesses, people started working from home, students had home-based learning, and there was isolation of migrant workers in the dormitories, mandatory face mask temperature screening, and contact tracing. And this was compensated to support the households with financial support, subsidies, and distribution of personal protection equipment. So I would like to share the results of these the three publications that recently came out uh, this month. So the first is about the social economic impact of COVID-19 mitigation measures on Singapore citizens. So you can see here that the majority of respondents actually felt that one of the major disruption was on social interaction and socializing. Uh, also visiting extended family. In particular, for the second part, the second, uh, the visiting extended family, the unmarried and retired people were more likely to report that as a disruption. In terms of exercising and sports activity, which is the third biggest disruption, we had males uh, more likely to report that disruption than female. For household income, we had the, the group uh, age group of 25 to 34 years old that were more likely to report uh, disruption in household income. I would like to just mention the last one on household harmony. 16% of uh, our respondents mentioned that it was disruptions at that level, and especially um, unemployed respondents, and, but uh, respondents of 55 years and above were less likely to report that there were some disruptions at that level. Um, we also had uh, economic disruptions such as uh, disruptions in employment. Younger workers in Singapore were more likely to report being asked to work from home rather than older workers, proportionately. Uh, people between 25 and 44 years old were more likely to report having their hours increased rather than other age groups. Malay respondents, were more likely to report disruptions to the ability to pay living expenses and to pay debt compared with other ethnicities. 
Malay respondents were some more likely to report that they were worried about their financial situation, ability to pay bills, etc. They were more likely to report being retrenched, uh, being put on furlough, being put on unpaid leave compared with other groups. However, respondents of Chinese ethnicity were more likely to believe that the economic situation in Singapore would be going into recession in 12 months compared to Malay respondents. So interesting perception difference. Full-time workers were more likely to report having their hours increase, whereas part-time workers were more likely to report having their hours decreased. So we'll move on now to the second publication, which is access to resources. So here, I would like to show one more graph. So we had average percentage household reporting a lack of access to these resources. Um, next slide. So income, savings, financial resources, exercise facilities, having a personal vehicle, uh, space for working from home were the top uh, uh, lack of resources. In terms of reporting receiving support during the circuit break and breaker period by type of support, we have, of course, personal protective equipment that was very strong, um, including masks, financial support, 29%, flexible uh, work arrangement. And interestingly, interestingly 23% of our respondents actually said that they received no support. So what type of support? What is a source of support that they receive? Half of the respondents said that they received from the government, followed by extended family and relatives, social networks, and finally the top, among the top four, their employers. So company, work colleagues, and professional networks, followed by uh, community-based organization, neighborhoods, etc. Nearly 20% of respondents under 45 years old reported a lack of space to work from home in contrast to 8% for those who are age 55 and above. And as many as 18% of our respondents aged between 45 and 55 reported insufficient access to computers compared to less than 10% for all other age groups, which affected their situation at work. In terms of access to resources, uh, more than one out of five households with children reported not having sufficient space to work from home, in contrast to about one in 10 households without children. As much as 16% of households with children reported insufficient access overall to IT devices compared to 7% without children. Now I would like to move to uh, the next, well, one more information here. Malay respondents were more likely than other major official ethnic groups to report receiving every kind of support that was in the survey and more likely to receive support from NGOs, businesses, schools, faith-based organizations, clubs, and associations. Retired persons were less likely than other groups to receive uh, to report receiving financial assistance. And finally, fi full-time workers generally reported higher levels of healthcare support and flexible work arrangements. Households making less than 3,000 per month, Singapore dollars, were less likely to receive flexible working arrangements. And households earning over $15,000 a month were more likely to report receiving support from businesses, NGOs, faith-based organizations, social organizations, friends, and place of employment. Next is gender differences in resident perception of Singapore's COVID-19 circuit breaker. So we had men were more likely to be put on furlough, unpaid leave, and having their hours reduced compared to women. And women were more like were slightly more likely to report not being employed. So we had a few uh, a few um, gender differences here, as I mentioned. Then access to resources. 
we showed a significant correlation between gender and access to food, household supply, IT device, and exercise facilities. Men, re male respondents were more likely to report insufficient access to food, IT devices, and exercise facilities, as I mentioned before. Men were two to three times more likely than women to report receiving support from NGOs, and twice as likely than women to report receiving support from businesses. Men were slightly more likely to report receiving support from their place of employment. So allow me to go to the final part of my presentation, which is perceptions of COVID-19 mitigation measures. So we asked what is the preferred basis for factors to prioritize when deciding about uh, restrictions and the top priority was seen as health and safety. The second priority was economics and livelihoods. The third priority was psychological and social well-being. And privacy was privacy and individual liberties was the last. Most agreed that the sacrifices to their personal life, work, and privacy were worth were worth it. They generally agreed with the circuit breaker measures and their perception here. I'm going a little fast because time is short. Um, females were more likely to be uh, in agreement with the, that the impacts of the measure were uh, worth it. And I'll skip on that, just move to the next one. Willingness to continue with measure mitigation measures after the circuit breaker met, uh, period, as you can see, 60% were willing to continue working from home, staggered shifts, etc., and face mask as well. Almost done. Personal burden, uh, as I said, most agreed that the restrictions on their personal movement, work, and privacy were uh, worth making. So I think overall, uh, most households uh, were supportive, uh, and uh, there was overwhelming uh, support for the circuit breaker. There was also a um, high level of trust in the government, uh, which started an early response. And the high level of confidence was also due to good communication. However, we have to note that many citizens and PRs uh, also receive a combination of support from government as well as other organizations. And also our survey here does not include uh, non-PRs and non-Singaporeans. So not considered are some of the vulnerable groups such as uh, migrant workers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Caroline. That's uh, a lot of information and interesting findings for, for us to chew on, particularly the, the part on the, the sources of support. I thought that was um, particularly poignant, talking about the humanitarian community and looking at what some of those uh, organizations were perceived to be doing um, in that. And perhaps we can talk more about that in the uh, Q&A. Um, our second speaker is uh, Anne Moy. Uh, who will give us a perspective from, from UNHCR to look at the, the role of the private sector, as well as uh, give us um, uh, an update on some of the global dis, um, displacement trends and as well what some of the work that UNHCR has been doing in, in this period. Uh, Anne, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Alistair. Hi, everyone. I hope that you are all doing uh well in, in, in these very challenging and strange times. Um, let me just uh, quickly just share my screen. Okay, so I believe, I hope that you can now share my screen, uh, see my screen. Okay, so in, in the next uh, 10 minutes, I will be sharing about the global displacement situation, what UNHCR is doing to help those who are affected and also I'll be talking a little bit about why partnerships is key to effective humanitarian action. Okay, so for those of you who do not know who we are, we are the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Our international mandate is to save lives, protect rights, and build a better future for refugees, internally displaced persons, as well as stateless people. So some of you may be wondering, you know, who and what exactly are refugees, internally displaced persons, as well as stateless uh, people. So, um, well, refugees and internally displaced persons are essentially the same in the sense that they were both forced to flee due to war, violence or persecution. 
the only main difference is that refugees have to cross borders in order to be safe, whereas internally displaced persons, um, they, are, uh, they are finding safety in different cities, provinces or districts within their own countries. Then we also have stateless people. These are people who are not considered as nationals uh, by any state under the operation of its law. Uh, in, this, uh, in this slide, I just wanted to share a few key figures related to the displacement uh, situation. So at the end of 2019, there were over 80 million possibly displaced people worldwide. Um, that's approximately the population of Germany. That's also 1% of the entire global population. Uh, of the 79.5 million displaced, 26 million, are, uh, 26 million are refugees and 45.7 million are internally displaced people. And now if I could just uh, draw your attention to this little chart here on the left, um, you will see that in 1990, there were over 40 million possibly, possibly displaced people worldwide. And in a span of just 20 years, the numbers have doubled to 80 million. So these numbers just indicate how big of a crisis this whole displacement situation is. So how does UNHCR help the displaced? Um, so at this stage, I would like to share that refugees usually leave behind everything in order to make, uh, in order to be safe. They leave behind everything to make the dangerous journey to safety. So that is why it is so important for us to rush in life, a life-saving assistance such as shelter, food, water, as well as uh, medical care. So right now, for example, there is a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. Around 550,000 Afghans have been newly displaced inside the country due to conflict. Many families speak of having to flee, of having to leave uh, at just a moment's notice with only just the clothes on their backs. So UNHCR, we seek to assist these people by providing emergency shelter and call relief items such as tents, hygiene kits, blankets, sleeping mats, kitchen sets, as well as PPEs. So in this picture here, you will see an internally displaced Afghan. You can see around her, you know, um, you know uh, what she uses for shelter. So for our aim is to provide better quality shelter for the displaced. So apart from providing critical life-saving aid, we also focus on safeguarding their rights by ensuring safety, documentation, and access to education and skills. So more often than not, refugees and displaced people, uh, what they want is to be self-reliant. And so we do whatever we can to help them get there. So one of the most effective ways people can rebuild their lives with dignity and in peace is through the opportunity to work and earn a living. So wherever possible, we seek to promote livelihoods and economic inclusion for refugees. So you can see here in this picture, uh, this is a young Venezuelan refugee in Ecuador. She's making a food delivery uh, using electric bikes uh, provided by UNHCR. Ultimately as well, refugees, they need a safe place to call home where they can build a better life. So we help families and individuals return home when it is safe to do so. We also enable them to settle and make a positive contribution in a new community if they are not able to return home. So in this picture, you will see uh, refugees from different countries and backgrounds uh, being resettled to the US. Okay, so COVID-19 has brought about a wide range of challenges for everyone and refugees have not been spared. Um, in fact, refugees are especially vulnerable to COVID-19 as well as other communicable diseases due to geographical mobility, instability, overcrowded conditions, often inadequate access to hygiene and sanitation, as well as variable access to quality essential health services. COVID-19, unfortunately, has also brought about negative social economic, social economic impacts for refugees because refugees, they have the least secure livelihood options and are, op and are often dependent on daily labor or small scale business options. So for example, some of them, uh, they run small little market stores. So, um, so with COVID-19 and all the associated restrictions, these populations have lost their livelihoods. So you will see here in this picture, these are refugees are on a Greek island. They are queuing up for assistance, such as food and other essential items. So um, how has UNHCR taken steps to mitigate the spread of the disease among refugees? 
So we have been participating in national COVID-19 preparedness and response planning and also advocating for these plans to include refugees. We have also been purchasing supplies like PPEs for our health partners, uh, purchasing medicines as well as uh, medical supplies. We have also been improving water sanitation and hygiene conditions by increasing the number of water points and the quantity of water provided and also by increasing the number of hand washing facilities. We have also been strengthening communication with uh, communities and disseminating fact-based information on preventive, on preventative measures such as hand washing, social distancing, uh, self-isolation self when needed, as well as where to access healthcare services. So here in this picture, you will see Hannah. Hannah is the lady in the yellow vest. So Hannah is a refugee who has been trained to be a community-based protection volunteer. As a community-based protection volunteer, Hannah passes on information to her community about COVID-19 and also how they can change their hygiene behaviors to prevent the spread of COVID-19 as well as other illnesses. We have also been ensuring that people who are extremely vulnerable to the pandemic receive assistance in the form of cash. So cash assistance is a critical modality and with COVID refugees receiving cash grants, uh, sorry, with COVID refugees have been receiving cash grants several months upfront so as to reduce the unnecessary movement to collect cash. So we find that this cash assistance is actually very helpful as it allows uh, very helpful as it allows people to use um, to use the cash to buy food, soap, water, or pay their rent in the event of a lockdown. Um, and we have also been we have also been providing improved shelter and settlement conditions to reduce density and overcrowded living conditions. And we have also expanded investments in distant education as well as alternative solutions to ensure that refugee children can continue to uh, have access to education in the event of a lockdown where schools and learning centers are closed. So for example, we have been uh, supporting national government initiatives to launch online learning platforms. We have also been distributing self-study packs to refugee children so that you know, they can study uh, at home on their own. We have also been broadcasting lessons on radio stations. So you can see here in this picture, this is a, a a refugee in Burkina Faso holding a radio. Um, and in Indonesia, just very close to us, learning centers, learning continues through instant messaging and video conferencing applications. So we are talking about very simple things like WhatsApp uh, and Zoom. So um, these students together with their teachers, they form uh, study groups on WhatsApp and they send each other voice notes, videos, as well as uh, worksheets. Um, so in this slide, I, just, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about our workforce. So um, uh, one of the reasons why we are able to respond to crisis at scale is in part due to our rather large workforce. So we have over 17,000 personnel in over 135 countries. 90%, 90 of our workforce is actually working on the ground directly with the refugees and the internally displaced people. So I am part of the 10% that is not on the ground and my job is to mobilize resources in support of these programs and interventions that we have on the ground. So um, in terms of funding, not many people know this, but uh, we are just one of very few UN agencies that is funded almost entirely by voluntary contributions. Only 1% of our annual budget is covered uh, by a subsidy from the UN uh, uh, regular budget. And 3% of, uh, of our funding is covered by other intergovernmental organizations like UNICEF, WHO, WFP. And 96% of our funding is actually from the private sector governments uh, as well as the EU, European Union. Um, just wanted to share as well that UNHCR is a partnerships focus agency. So wherever we work, we work in partnership with governments, NGOs, community-based organizations, refugees, host communities, as well as the private sector. So how do um, uh, entities and individuals in the private sector help us? 
they can make a grant donation, which is quite straightforward. They can also make an in-kind contribution. But here, I just wanted to share that these, these in-kind contributions, they really need to match our needs on the ground. They need to be something that our refugees need or our operations need. Um, the private sector can also engage employees and customers to raise awareness and funds for us. So, for example, in the UK, Vodafone organized a charity bike ride for their employees and their employees collectively raised $1 million for UNHCR's education programs. Uh, companies and individuals can also provide services, expertise and innovation to us. So, for example, we have a partnership with UPS, the logistics company. So, uh, apart from shipping, um, you know, core relief items for us for free, they also share their expertise in logistics management with us. Um, so, uh, two of our biggest partners globally include Uniqlo and IKEA. Uh, Uniqlo is our biggest partner in Asia, while IKEA is our biggest partner globally. So with these two companies, we work with them through a multifaceted partnership. Apart from donating cash, both, com both companies also make in-kind donations to UNHCR. IKEA, for example, donates mattresses and mosquito nets, while Uniqlo donates clothes. Uh, both companies also use their marketing and social media channels to raise awareness and funds for UNHCR through their employees and their customers. And both companies also hire refugees in certain countries. So um, apart from our private sector partners, we also very, work very closely with nonprofit organizations and NGOs. So, so this, this is just a snapshot of some of the partners we have. So for these NGOs, some of them, um, uh, most of them, they have their own programs that they implement on the ground. And some of them also uh, implement programs that are funded by UNHCR. And just to share as well that uh, in Singapore, UNHCR works very closely with local partners like the Ramatan Lil Alamin Foundation, as well as Relief Singapore. So Relief Singapore, they are one of our dearest partners in Singapore. Besides working with us to bring more awareness to the refugee cause and implementing their own healthcare and sports programs in Bangladesh, they also raise funds to support our work. So they very recently launched a crowdfunding campaign on Give Asia to raise funds for our operations in Bangladesh to help us tackle the growing humanitarian, uh, growing humanitarian needs during this monsoon season. Uh, so if you're keen on supporting our work there, please uh, feel free to, to scan this QR code and make a donation on the crowdfunding um, platform. And uh, I just wanted to uh, close this, uh, my presentation by leaving you a quote from Halet Hosseini. This is an author, uh, UNHCR Goodwill Ambassador, as well as a former refugee from Afghanistan. Refugees are mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, children with hopes and ambitions as us, except that a twist of fate has bound, this refugee, bound them to a global refugee crisis on an unprecedented scale. Okay, so with that, I would like to, um, my slide cannot move. With that, I would like to conclude my presentation and I leave you here my email address and my number. Thanks, Anne. Without further ado, I will I'll move straight on to Aimee George as we're, we're you know, close on time here. Um, so Aimee, if you'd like to, to share your perspective on, on some of the developments from, uh, from the regional perspective in, in Asia and the work of, say, Thank you so much and thank you again RSIS for the kind invitation. So I am here today presenting as uh, representing Save the Children and as Al said we have our Asia regional office based here we're a UK based entity and in Asia we cover 22 offices across the APAC and we've been here in Singapore since 2010. Now as we talk about uh, disasters and, and the crises along with COVID we often refer to it as a disaster within a disaster because often we're dealing with natural crises, uh, nat natural hazards, as well as um, conflict within the context of the pandemic. And so um, the areas we cover as, um, as east as the, the Pacific, so example in Vanuatu yesterday, there was a tsunami warning after an earthquake to as west as Afghanistan, as we've uh, heard some examples today with everything that's going on. And so in such emergencies, uh, both rapid and slow onset. Now, I speak also to you as a Singaporean practitioner. The last decade, I've spent uh, time working in Afghanistan, Myanmar, Thailand, Palestine, among others. And it's always been a focus on, on vulnerable communities, including uh, refugees that Anne spoke to as well. 
And so sharing today insights, um, I hope is an exchange. And I also quite like, uh, we've been on many webinars, especially in this pandemic world that we're in, but as um, hopefully you're listening to some of the points that I share as well as in the Q&A, I wanted to, do, to share a couple of um, reflective practice um, questions maybe that you can consider for yourself or the organizations that you belong to. This is a practice um, that I picked up in my peace building um, training where reflective practice is a chance for us to really be thinking not just in our mind, but putting it down as well, how things work, um, what, how, how do we've learned from our experiences and how do we develop on experience-based theory as well. So I know that the participants today come from a background um, as academics, as practitioners themselves. And I hope that, that uh, this tiny exercise, or at least exposing it maybe, uh, will be allow you to, to take it up in, in your own time as well. Now, um, in terms of challenges, we, we've even just following the news, we know there's plenty, but there's two in particular that stand out from our view, um, if I could say representing international NGOs um, or, or even national and local NGOs. Um, the first is that COVID, we know isn't just a health crisis. I think from, from Colleen, um, Caroline's and Anne's presentation, it's more than that. It's been a socioeconomic crisis as well and exposing so many of the flaws and the vulnerabilities that folks are facing. And especially now where we're facing um, just COVID fatigue, right? Wave after wave, lockdown after lockdown. How do, we, how do we work through that and still support people as best as possible? And so using it as an example, Save the Children, we focus primarily on life-saving services when in maternal and child health. And so we looking at um, you know, acute malnutrition, we, um, oftentimes it's not just COVID that's, that's um, hurting communities. It's often the fact that there's, there's poor coping mechanisms, ways for people to manage because they're impacted socioeconomically. And that's also where loss of life happens. So just wanted to point that out uh, as a first challenge. The second being, um, it hasn't quite been mentioned yet today, but just the impacts of climate change. We know we're living through it, even as Singaporeans, those in the region, but as because it's transnational in nature, um, it's, it's happening more frequently and more intensely than ever before, so that it's really been difficult for, for communities to recover from it um, and, and less time, really. Um, we all probably came across last week's IPCC um, report telling us about the worst consequences of, of climate impacts. We're seeing it now with current weather, extreme weather from the Siberian wildfires to, to all over Europe. Um, and next, actually this year's World Humanitarian Day highlights the immediate human cost of the, hum the climate crisis. And so I thought it was important to, to consider that as we think how we can um, be taking meaningful climate action within our own spaces or in whether private or public, um, persuading leaders to, to be engaged in the issue. And of course, we've, you've probably heard the expression to build back better as we're thinking about COVID recovery plans. Um, it's also a great opportunity to think about how do we not just reduce risk of both the pandemic, but also thinking about climate disasters in, in that light as well. So um, I just wanted to, to reference that. Now, as we shift into um, new modalities, I wanted to um, just share a couple of points on, on potential innovations. Now, I know that's a buzzword for many, um, but more than it just being a term, this, uh, excuse me, as I just flash the slides here. Um, innovation, now it is a buzzword, but I don't want it to just be that. I want it for you in your spaces that you represent be thinking about how we've been doing things differently. Um, we've been forced to do it in some cases this past year and a half. Um, sometimes it's out of necessity, but it ends up maybe leading to even cutting edge opportunities on how we should work. Excuse me, um, is there watcher time? Um, for example, again, coming back to maternal and child health, as we're talking about um, in, in our work, we reference it as community-based management of acute malnutrition. So you can't um, you can't quite do everything digitally or from afar. You have to, we, had to, we had to adapt a lot of our programming as well. So we still had to reach mothers, uh, provide critical services um, and ensuring that it's in a safe environment. So a lot of um, our, expo our work is also in making sure that we had to restructure the way clinics were handled, doing uh, social distancing practices as part of in, in, um, um, IPC and in, uh, infection prevention control. And so we saw examples even here in our home, home country or in the region as well. We had to shift a lot to digitization methods. We, for prenatal and postnatal care for young mothers, we had to turn to telemedicine services, even in some of the most remote areas, managing with that. And then of course, capacity building opportunities for the health workers as we shifted to so many new modalities. And for those who might not be aware, 
I wanted to point you also to Kaya and Disaster Response as great, great platforms for you to be looking at uh, ways to develop your skills as well. And so just wanted to point that out. Um, but beyond those adaptations, there are maybe three overarching points that I wanted us to reflect on today. Um, and that is firstly, how do we leverage our unique strengths while seeking out that collaboration? And uh, thankfully ended on that point there about partnerships. And so I wanted to share a few examples that uh, we've been able to, to have um, at Save the Children. So one area that we don't often talk about is uh, social and behavior com change communication. And at Save the Children, as of course being child focused in our programming, we have a specific center for utilizing behavioral insights for children, CUBIC is the acronym. And we've been tying up with private partners as well to think about how we can be not only um, promoting, for example, COVID vaccination uptake, but also helping in, in, in any way to help us reduce to return to this new normal, right? And this world we're in, as well as mobilizing children and youth as vaccination champions. And so we have these platforms that we call digital hangout spaces where youth from across either within their country or across borders as well, get to meet in virtual spaces, discuss what they're thinking about. And a lot of it's picking up on those behavioral insights and trends to be thinking, how do we not only encourage, um, encourage uptake and promote it, but also of course, tackle misinformation that's out there, right? Another core area um, in the work is what we reference as RCCE. It's called risk communication and community engagement. Now for organizations, wherever your means are, we all have our own scale and scope where we are able to tackle an infection prevention and control. And so I wanted to bring up an example from Afghanistan, working with the mobile company Viamo, um, which, and also the public health um, at the time where we facilitated these, you didn't need any, anything high tech. It was very simple phones, which is a basic that folks have to be able to access information. You kind of put prompts in um, to learn about prevention, resilience, and well-being for, for parents, caregivers, and children as well. So, you know, it's important uh, that we kind of leverage us, our strengths at Save the Children, being child-focused, youth-focused, um, and seeking out these collaboration opportunities going forward. My next point to touch on is the importance of efficacy of, uh, and the efficacy, excuse me, of preparedness and what we call anticipatory action within the disaster life cycle. So with any, you know, even in project management, any of the fields we're in, there's always preparations before, during, and after. And for our line of work as well, it's really important to address potentially catastrophic impacts on children in the years ahead uh, by strengthening our emergency preparedness at all levels. Now, uh, you might not know that statistically, 55% of funding, humanitarian funding is actually used in crisis response, in, including in Anne's presentation, she mentioned a number, number of them. And actually a mere tiny 1% is used for preparedness and for early actions. And so, you know, evidence actually tells us that when we invest in a timely way in preparedness, it allows us to double our response caseload that we're able to reach as well as half the cost um, that we incur into such services. So we end up saving more lives and livelihoods actually. And so at Save the Children and many other organizations, there are thing, um, activities like forecast-based early action when it comes to flooding, where you know where certain areas are more prone to flooding they, they have to tackle um, and, and giving um, cash assistance beforehand or activities that, that will help them prepare ahead of time, as well as uh, the modality of cash and vouchers assistance. For example, in Afghanistan with food and secure areas, um, we've been helping communities identified as the most severe so that before they have to go to negative coping mechanisms, uh, before even reaching that point, they are already supported. And so for those on the line who have the power to give, uh, this is a really important point that preparedness is probably more important even than just focusing on the response end as well. Uh, lastly, and I, I know I'll have to watch time as well, um, is I wanted to speak kind of a, maybe at a head and heart level of what it means to revive humanitarianism humanitarianism and solidarity in our sector. Now, there's been traditional models, the way that it's set up too in the world where, you know, traditional donors are struggling themselves, right? And so as COVID has spoke, uh, sparked a movement, I think, of citizens and multi-sectors, you know, everywhere supporting wherever they can. We, we've seen it in industry where they've created PPE out of, you know, it's something that they didn't do before. We're hearing it online with mutual aid networks to plug short-term gaps. You know, I think here in Singapore too, we can think maybe how can we encourage the spirit of volunteerism further? How can each of us uh, within our own networks push for a greater focus on well-being, solidarity, and justice? And also that you know humanitarian efforts 
at the end of the day, not just uh, within our borders, but speaking as a Singaporean to the importance of it outside of it, we know that it'll bring great dividends. Um, so I'll leave it there and hopefully we have a chance to get to some questions um, during the Q&A as well. Thank you. Thanks to all, all three speakers for, for sharing their perspectives um, on the panel. I think you, you ended off with quite a few thought-provoking comments. Um, so I might just swing them back to the other panelists uh, here and to ask them perhaps what they think about the uh, way in which we understand humanitarianism or humanitarian action has changed in, in COVID. Uh, and then I'll go to uh, a second question. So perhaps, Caroline, do you think from the, the perception survey that you did that the way we understand humanitarian action now has really changed? And then we'll, we'll go to Anne. Uh, thank you. Uh, sadly, I was not able to follow the last five minutes. I was busy answering questions from the from the floor. However, your question is very clear. Um, from our survey, uh, again, I have to mention the survey took place during COVID-19 break, uh, uh, circuit breaker. So that is last year. Uh, it highlighted to me and to my colleagues that there were more players uh, that played significant roles than uh, than we expected, and it was interesting to see, for example, maybe that there might have been some constraints to the degree to which, uh, say, uh, community based organization, faith based faith based organization, and uh, even um, you know private organizations could provide more support it because of the uh, restrictions, the physical restrictions of movement. So what I think this leads to is the importance of recognizing that perhaps we need to focus more on enabling a, multi a multiplicity of actors and facilitating their involvement in a more significant way rather than trying to centralize uh, help. So proximity to communities will always be an advantage to being able to know what are the needs uh, of the, uh, the, the, the sub uh, segments of the population. And that is a network that may not be formal, that may be informal. So I think that uh, we've seen, at least since uh, the, the um, circuit breaker, how uh, informal networks were enabled through um, uh, social media by forming these emerging spontaneous type of uh, um, fundraisers for different groups, especially I'm talking still in Singapore. So I think that uh, there's a there's a lot a lot has changed through this uh, this crisis, and uh, given its protracted crisis, I think that it will also have a longer term impact in terms of the way that we are uh, providing assistance to each other. Great, thank you. And would you like to share your your reflection on this? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, and with UNHCR, you know, the COVID pandemic has really affected our operations in quite a number of ways. Uh, one, we were not able to be on the ground as much as we want to because, you know, of all these movement restrictions. So uh, one of the ways in which we have tackled this is actually to train more refugees who are actually on the ground to uh, be our eyes and ears on the ground. We train them to be health volunteers. We, we train them to go around actually uh, spreading fact-based information about COVID-19 to the community members. Another thing that has affected us a great deal is our ability to ship supplies uh, all over the world, all these core relief items as well as the PPEs. So uh, we looked internally within the countries, with, uh, within the refugee camps, within the settlements themselves, and we have trained all these, uh, uh, for example, uh, you know, there's a lack of PPEs, so we have... Uh, um, uh, we have uh, asked our refugee tailors to actually make a uh, sort um, reusable face mask for us because since we know we're not able to supply this this uh, as much as we would like to and then obviously you know the pandemic has also uh, caused a lot of uh, learning centers to be closed as well and that's why I mentioned earlier that we have uh, increased our investments in distance education um, we have tried to move uh, all these education lessons online Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to return to Aimee uh, in the, the discussion here, just to ask you about the role of anticipatory action. There's a question there from Dr. Lena Gong. But the broader question here is that we're moving towards uh, an ever ready system that we've always got to be looking forward uh, to the next potential uh, 
um, disaster and look at uh, institutional transformation. So perhaps you could share a bit about what, what SAVE is doing in this space uh, in terms of um, changing the way it operates in, um, in its operations. Yeah, thanks for the question, Lina. Um, now, shifting, shifting has, has many mo mo uh, meanings, of course, and so a larger percentage is, is what the hope is. And so we've got very targeted, I think 15% is a target I mentioned earlier, 1% kind of on average globally is where preparedness um, resources are put. So we've actually targeted 15%. Um, and so we have a flexible fund where um, our country officers are able to, to tap into and always seeking it from external, external support as well, so that we can be planning. So within the disaster cycle too, we consider even before something happens, looking at triggers for something uh, like slow onset, for example, with the drought, you can identify, um, you know, um, food sources that folks are having, um, livelihood opportunities uh, within the household, whether, whether people are able to access things. So those are certain triggers that happen in slow onset so that you know ahead of time, okay, something bad is about to happen. Instead of waiting for it to happen, let's do something about it. So a more recent example, of course, before um, the current crisis in, in, in uh, Afghanistan, it's already had another disaster on top of that, which is with the drought that was declared last year, uh, excuse me, last month. And so we identified in some of the most vulnerable communities, um, homes where they're um, women-led, child-led, um, folks who might be disabled, more vulnerable um, communities, where they might be needing extra support on food items or cash to put, be able to purchase certain items so that before they have to go into negative coping mechanisms, for example, you know, child, children going out to labor or you know, not to save another mouth having to be fed, uh, being into forced marriages, before they have to resort to those things, we're helping take care at the individual level and household level so that it prevents them from, from negative impacts afterwards. Um, and so that's, that's one example uh, as one with, with flood preparation as well. You kind of know in a seasonal, seasonal um, hazard like that, certain flood prone areas and doing the same thing, identifying vulnerable communities so that ahead of time, before the triggers happen, uh, communities are, are prepared. Great, thank you. There is a, a follow-up question in the Q&A chat, but I'm conscious of time and want to have uh, space for each of you to, to have one more round. Um, so if I just uh, mention that the, there's a question in the uh, Q&A function um, from Carla Lim asking, have you received any pushback uh, from donors over investing in anticipatory action and the predicted scenario doesn't eventuate. So hold your thought on that. And I think there's a broader question which I can pose to all the panelists here. Um, and this is from uh, Louis Montesclaros uh, here at RSIS, who's asking about the, the current challenges, and I'm gonna paraphrase here, because it's quite long. Um, the crisis that we've seen through COVID has really blurred the boundaries between humanitarian and development actors. So how do you think this is going to cause us to rethink uh, the way in which the humanitarian community works with other sectors? Uh, and what does that mean uh, for us going forward? Uh, and that will be the, the last question for each of the panelists. And if you can perhaps end with uh, a couple of final thoughts, uh, please do so, but you have um, two minutes each and I'll start with uh, Caroline. Thank you. Yes, I mean, it has always been relatively fr frustrating to see that humanitarian actors sometimes did not see themselves as playing a big role in the longer term development because of the, the focus they had. And now I think that, I mean, there there is a recognition oh. that uh, that there is a continuity it needs to be uh, more synergistic as well. I mean, now I'm speaking from my other hat as working uh, in a faculty at uh, Brack University in Bangladesh, where we also work on the refugee crisis. So just to uh, expand this uh, discussion further. And, uh, and we've been approached by, uh, you know, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières and others who, you know, before were saying that, no, we are not development uh, agencies, we are humanitarian and focusing on relief, etc. And now they want to join forces in terms of the advocacy work. And why? I think it's because of the recognition that the major crises that are affecting us now are protracted. And we do not see them as in isolation in short term, and they are compounded as we were just discussing earlier, climate change, 
as well as uh, you know refugee crisis as well as the pandemic uh, so it's very it's very difficult now to to kind of compartmentalize the work so i'll end on that to ensure others can speak thank you okay Anne, your two minutes please okay uh, so mine will be less than two minutes so I think for the refugee cause, you know, it's very important to consider the humanitarian aspect as well as the development aspect of things as well. Like I shared earlier, you know, when refugees first take flight, the immediate things that they need is shelter and core relief items just to guarantee their survival. And then after that, you know, they, they don't just want to live, they want to rebuild their lives. But that's where we uh, give them the opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to gain some income generating uh, skills. We give them livelihood opportunities. We want to provide them with the tools to be able to rebuild their lives. Because when they rebuild their lives, when they're able to work, they also contribute to the local economy as well. And that creates a good relationship between the host communities and the refugees. So I think humanitarian and develop development work goes hand in hand. Thank you. Great, thanks. By me, and just a, a note about the pushback. And then uh, if you can comment as well on the uh, the humanitarian development divide as it's traditionally been referred to. Thanks. Yeah, for the for the pushback, I, I typed an answer, but just to quickly say, thankfully folks uh, tend to be coming around, but that it also differs with some of the more traditional institutional donors. We tend, depending on our donor funds, um, it, it's usually the ones who, who have uh, are more flexible and have uh, I tend quicker to be able to turn around and seeing the importance of having uh, flexible funds to be able to use it as necessary. But yes, COVID has opened everybody's eyes and thankfully um, um, it, within the sector, we're realizing that even beforehand what we can be doing um, to it, things exacerbate uh, that that's very much in the direction. But as I said, statistically, it's still a very small number. And you know, besides increasing the pot, we need to be thinking about how we can better apportion the pot as well too, because we know that it is gonna be limited, unfortunately, um, as trends go. And yeah, the, the, the nexus, it's, it's an interesting one, especially working with the refugee community and especially in protracted contexts where that humanitarian um, development divide is, is so blurred. Um, we, we recognize now that uh, we have to be thinking long term, not just in the relief recovery stage, um, but it's been rhetoric for a while and, and uh, more needs to be done. I'll have to leave it there uh, quickly, but thanks for the question, Jose. Great, thank you. And thanks to all the panelists. I think we've had some um, really interesting perspectives uh, shared here in our, our quick fire one round um, or two rounds now and one hour uh, of the perspectives. So thank you all very much to, to the panelists and maybe um, I'll, I'll just uh, turn back to Prof Melly to uh, say a few words to uh, wrap up the uh, one hour webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Al. And um, again, let me echo my thanks to all the three panelists. Um, what's really uh, interesting in, in the conversation to me is the whole notion of, you know, our, our understanding of how humanitarianism can actually change, uh, um, especially when it comes to, uh, when, when it's compounded by another crisis, which is, of course, the pandemic. And sometimes when we think about the pandemic, we don't think that it is a humanitarian crisis because it's a medical crisis. But as it turned out, and especially hearing from practitioners on the ground, that you know we really need to be able to see and to understand you know how these kinds of events can cut across the kind of already humanitarian challenges that we face. I thought that was really my main takeaway. But the other is this whole notion of what happens when mobility is affected as a result of the pandemic. And I like the point that was raised. I think it was you, Carolyn, who talked about proximity, right? That, you know, you, you end and Anne's point about if you're not there, then you, you make, you know, you try to tap on the resources that you have on the ground. And for refugees, you know, you tap on the refugees themselves who have proof, who have benefited from the assistance that from from other actors and who have acquired the skills to actively provide that assistance. I thought that was that was really very very uh, helpful. And to Amy, I mean, you know, how you sort of 
rethink and, and recalibrate your approaches in light of, of this new pandemic, I thought was also very useful. So overall, I mean, there's a lot of takeaway. Uh, oh, one more thing before I forget, um, Carolyn, the, the, the uh, survey that you that you uh, conducted with your colleagues and we, we had the opportunity to, to also publish as an insight has actually received a lot of positive responses. So I think what would be good is to, to chop them into bite pieces so that we can we can publish and circulate that further. So thank you again uh, to my colleagues in the HIDR program of, of the center. It's, it's really very good. And uh, yeah, um, Al, I think you should close this. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Meli. Thank you to everyone and to uh, Chris, who's been organizing this with uh, Shin and Joey. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we will see you all soon in person. So I think with that, um, have a good afternoon from all of us at RSIS. Thank you.